In a recent premium video for the Lotus Eaters, John and I had a lengthy discussion on Watchmen, where we explored some of its philosophical and political themes. If you're interested in hearing that, you can check that video out here. While I did really enjoy that discussion, I didn't get the chance to go over everything I had in mind regarding the comic and the film adaptation in particular. So I thought I would go a bit more in depth here. I'll just make a side note as well that we already mentioned the HBO television series as part of that discussion, and I don't plan on watching it, so do not expect me to be mentioning that here. So, adaptation is on everybody's mind at the moment, from Americans butchering beloved Japanese media to every Western fantasy series under the sun, getting its own woke reinterpretation. Anyone hoping for their favorite series to get a faithful adaptation is pretty much out of luck. And now Amazon's Lord of the Rings adaptation, The Rings of Power, is looming on the horizon. And it doesn't look like it's going to be paying much respect to Tolkien's vision of Middle-earth at all. But this does raise the question, what makes a good adaptation? Is it as simple as copying the major events from a book and putting them on screen? Or is it something more? Can you truly capture the original magic of a story through adaptation? It is an art and a tightrope act, after all, taking what worked in one medium and faithfully adapting it to another without losing what people loved in the first place. Studios make demands for mass appeal, while the fans, not unreasonably, demand what they already loved. Taking what's on the page and putting it to the screen introduces limitations. So when choosing what to cut, important decisions have to be made and considerations taken into what will affect the story. And how much can you cut and change before you're telling a different story altogether. Even seemingly minor changes can set off this domino effect, and Watchmen makes a great case study into this. So for the uninitiated, here's some background. Watchmen is one of the most beloved comics of all time. So much so that it's escaped the niche realm of comic book circles and become a touchstone of popular culture. Its writer, Alan Moore, despite being a cranky leftist, is from a time where a writer, no matter how political, could put aside his political biases, for the most part, and pay respect to the characters and world that his fiction brought to life. Now that we're being bombarded with the absolute farce of Marvel producing characters such as Snowflake and Safe Space, and some writers inserting themselves into characters that act solely as mouthpieces for leftist rants, I personally yearn for times when political subversion wasn't the main consideration, or was at least a little bit subtle. Moore is also responsible for some of the most influential comics of the 1980s, including The Killing Joke, Swamp Thing, V for Vendetta, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and more. They're all known for being dark and gritty, which became typical for comics in the 1980s, when the funny books began telling more edgy and realistic stories, as can be seen from other series like Frank Miller's iconic Dark Knight Returns, but comics in the 1990s embraced this aesthetic as well, although they mainly did so because dark and gritty was cool. Moore's books aren't like that. They explore complex themes and characters with depth, and give the reader something to consider well after they put the book down. Whether I agree with Moore's worldview or not, he definitely had a lot more to say than most comic or film writers today. Sadly though, I do think that the dark and gritty aesthetic is what attracted director and perennial teenage edgelord Zack Snyder to the film adaptation. Anyone familiar with his work will know that Zack Snyder is a man who does not understand the word nuance or subtlety, and has made a career adapting other people's work. Watchmen, competing with his 300 adaptation and Dawn of the Dead remake, is considered his best film. Watchmen's film adaptation is also highly contentious, some seeing it as a fantastic panel-by-panel -panel recreation, and others considering a superficial mockery of the original comic. While I may not be at either extreme, I definitely consider it a massive downgrade. I must stress, however, not to put the blame of any negative changes solely at Snyder's feet, as he was working with a screenplay by Alex C, and shockingly enough, the voice of Solid Snake himself, David Hayter. As a disclaimer, I'm mainly going to be focusing on the theatrical release of the film, and not the ult extended Ultimate Cut, which adds about an extra hour to the runtime, reintroducing plots from the comic, such as the tales of the Black Freighter and the two Bernies at the paper stand. This version is a massive improvement, but most of the issues I bring up are still present in it, so my criticisms will still apply. Adaptation isn't quite as simple as copying comic panels straight onto the screen. Films have limitations on length and budget constraints that don't apply to serialized comic narratives. 
they also have different writers and directors who might possess visions that run counter to the original author's intent, which is something we've seen time and time again in recent years. Watchmen did recreate some panels and scenes straight from the page, but it makes enough subtle changes to the order of events, timelines, and even things as innocuous as the structure of character dialogue that it all snowballs, and by the end the themes are messy and some of the characters are shells of their comic counterparts, which isn't great for a story that's primarily a character study. With these caveats noted, adapting comic books should be easier than adaptation of a literary novel. Unlike the blocks of text you get in a book which require a certain level of interpretation, a comic is its own storyboard, which is how Robert Rodriguez used the comic for his 2005 adaptation of Sin City, which worked brilliantly. Now that special effects are becoming an, almost an afterthought, and green screens and CGI eliminate many technical difficulties, a big enough budget means that anything is possible. No liberties need to be taken with the visuals, nor contentious choices made between interpretations of how certain costumes or characters should look. You don't have to decipher the text, you can just look at the pictures. Despite this, Zack Snyder chose to make a number of changes, both superficial and otherwise, that changed the atmosphere and look of the film. One of the most obvious changes is some of the costumes, in particular Night Owl and Ozymandias. In the comic, they both wear appropriately themed fabric outfits. Night Owl looks like a big owl, and Ozymandias, from now on in this video referred to as Adrian, wears purple and gold Egyptian-themed garb. Simple enough. In the film, they've both got their owl and Egyptian themes going, but instead of fabric outfits, they're both wearing armor. You may think, that makes sense. These are people putting themselves in the line of fire, and it doesn't really change that much. However, it does exemplify the kind of changes that Snyder makes throughout the film. That is, the Snyder only seems to get half of what, of he, uh, of what he's adapting. Costumes back in the day were supposed to look like the kinds of goofy outfits that you would expect in ramshack DIY heroes and grandiose narcissistic uh, intellectuals would create for themselves, as well as parody the kinds of outfits worn by heroes in contemporary 80s comics. Snyder decided to do his own version of this. He very purposefully added rubber nipples to Adrian's suit to reference the famously campy outfits of the Joel Schumacher Batman films. However, it still reflected through the mud-smeared lens of Zack Snyder, and due to the lighting and grayscale, he can't help but produce something that looks far more sleek and cool than the original comic. While he tried to maintain its purpose through the adaptation, the very fact that Watchmen was a, sire of, uh, was a satire of comics, and this is trying to be a satire of comics and also contemporary films, a different medium with different storytelling goals, changes the character of the story. Whether you prefer it or not is your judgment, but you can't deny it is different, and perhaps the story loses a little bit of something from that. While we're on the subject of aesthetics, I have to mention the colour palette of the film. Now, the original comic does an astounding job of creating a dark and oppressive atmosphere, despite using bright colours such as pinks, purples, and yellows. Those vibrant colours create an effective contrast which gives everything a queasy and sickly look. On the other hand, Zack Snyder takes his typical route of achieving gritty and edgy by turning the picture's brightness down and casting everything in shades of grey. This dampens the contrast of the image, and any amateur graphic designer will tell you that contrast is one of the most effective ways of crafting eye-catching, striking imagery. Far from emphasizing the bleak atmosphere that he was going for, it instead just makes the world look drab and dour, sucking the life out of any visual flair the film would otherwise have. One other change that may go unnoticed by viewers before reading the comic is the clumsy depiction of violence. Now, I'm not going to get all squeamish here and say the film is too violent or anything. It's rated R for a reason, and the comic is just as, if not honestly, more violent. It's more how the violence is portrayed that's the big difference. In the comic, violence is measured and deliberate. No fanfare, it's just something that happens, a fact of the world that people live in. And in many cases, the film depicts violence in the same way best example being the Vietnam bar scene. Both versions depict the comedian murdering a pregnant Vietnamese woman in a brutal and unnecessary way. However, the rest of the film's a bit inconsistent in how seriously it takes the violence. In some cases, like Rorschach's prison escape, the violence is amplified. The mob boss orders his goon's arms amputated rather than his throat cut, giving us a chance for some grisly gore. Earlier in the film, Rorschach repeatedly butchers a rapist's skull with a cleaver rather than leaving him to burn alive off screen. Here, the violence we see 
is more extreme, probably to make it more visually interesting or just cooler. Snyder's favorite trick, slow-mo, doesn't help the fact that it could just be for coolness sake. I find it hard to think that Snyder is taking the violence as seriously as the book does when he deliberately slows it down at times so you can really appreciate how cool the whole thing looks. I appreciate some good gore in a film, so once again, whether you prefer it or not, is your own opinion, but it's a different experience to the book and not exactly faithful to the intention of the author. At other times, though, the violence is significantly toned down. The most glaring example is the tragedy in New York. The comic may have a silly, fantastical way of realizing this tragic event. A genetically engineered alien squid is teleported to New York and triggers a psychic explosion, killing millions. Sounds a bit outside the realm of reality. But, as unreal as this sounds, the comic makes it feel real by lingering on the destruction. You see, in full page spreads used here for the first time in the comic, all of the side characters you got to know throughout the story dead, surrounded by thousands of corpses piling on the streets and out of buildings. It's honestly pretty harsh imagery and I can understand why after 9-11 studios would be hesitant to show this happening in New York, but they do still blow up New York in the film. They just have it be a Dr. Manhattan blast that conveniently vaporizes the bodies so they don't have to linger on the human damage. There is a giant crater in New York that you see for about a minute, but in the end, it just doesn't hit as hard. I wouldn't be able to guess the intentions of some of these changes, but their inconsistently inconsistency honestly comes across to me like haphazardly making changes on a whim or sanitizing it for the studio rather than changing things for a purpose. And if they did have purpose, I don't think it was conveyed effectively. The violence of the original tells us something about the world and the people in it, and changing what's done or who it's done to may only create silent, slight differences on their own, but they add up to create a very different experience. This and the other aesthetic components of the film may seem minor to some, but are hugely important for our understanding of the world. Now onto the most important feature of Watchmen, its characters. Here we need to draw a distinction between means and ends. Much like in real life, there is a difference. In the real world, it's admirable to aim for a particular end or goal that you think is virtuous, but the moral character of the means, that being the actions that you take to get there, is what defines you. To use an example relevant to real life and Watchmen, it's all well and good to desire your, dis uh, desire your utopian world, but if you have to murder millions of innocent people to get there, that act of evil negates any supposed goodness in your intentions and is likely to have deformed your spirit in the process. Within adaptations, there are two approaches you can take. You can try to mix these, but for the purposes of simplicity, we'll keep this dichotomy. You could, as a director or scriptwriter, either keep the characters and plot consistent, or speed through all the cool scenes that you liked without worrying much about how the original story got there, otherwise known as seasons five through eight of Game of Thrones. In taking the second approach, as Zack Snyder does throughout Watchmen, you are likely to skip over character beats, which will either remove or change a character's personality. Snyder manages both. The worst victim of this is Laurie, the second Silk Spectre. In the first scene we meet her, in the comic, she displays some of her most important character traits, her difficult relationship with her mother, her desire to do something meaningful, and her assertiveness. It's an excellent demonstration of Moore's ability to get you to understand these characters efficiently. In the film, she is none of these things, almost a blank slate, even. They took her established character and replaced her with blank stares and inconsistent actions. How do we tell this? Like the comic, her first scene is in Dr. Manhattan's lab, and the second is in, her diner, is, is in a diner having dinner with Dan. This seems to be the same series of events that take place in the comic, but the mistake is assuming that having the same scene superficially is the same as translating the characters accurately. In the original scene, Rorschach shows up to warn Dr. Manhattan that somebody might try to kill him and to find out if he knows anything about the comedian's death. Manhattan dismisses the, uh, these worries and that's about all he has to do with the scene until he ejects Rorschach for upsetting Laurie. It's actually Laurie who is the driving force of the conversation, becoming increasingly angry at Rorschach for diminishing the severity of the comedian's attempted rape of her mother, which leads to his ejection. Then, after Rorschach is removed, she decides to go out for dinner with Dan without Dr. Manhattan. 
So within a few pages, we see a good overview of her character and establish her agency within the story, while at the same time showing how disconnected Manhattan is from their relationship and also our petty human affairs. In the film, Dr. Manhattan is the driving force of the scene, saying he can't take time off from working with Adrian on renewable energies, expositing about tachyons as lamp shading for the plot, and also ejecting Rorschach when he's bored. Laurie stands there the whole time, acting as a confused and grumpy sounding board to ask questions that benefit the audience. She's shown a flashback by Dr. Manhattan, who can just do that in this version, and then told that she's going to go to dinner with Dan, to which she obediently leaves. This barely scratches the surface of what was covered in the original. It gives us very little of her character and relationship with Manhattan, gives us no insight into her relationship with her mother, tells us barely anything about her feelings on Rorschach or the rest of her former friends, and succeeds in making Dr. Manhattan seem more sad and mopey than aloof and detached. I think the other prime victim of the transition from page to screen is Adrian Veidt, aka Ozymandias, the smartest man in the world, and ultimately the secret villain pulling the strings behind the scenes, who killed the comedian, engineered Dr. Manhattan's uh, exile from Earth to remove any potential issues with his plan to destroy New York. He suffers from some of the more extreme changes made in the film. In the comic, more created characters that lined up with particular philosophies. Rorschach is an objectivist, Dr. Manhattan is a materialist with an existentialist streak, and Adrian seems to me to be a utilitarian. He is the picture of a managerial, self-appointed expert class that believes that simply because he can solve a problem logically in his head, it means he has the right to play God with other people's lives to achieve his goals. What makes Adrian such an interesting villain to me is that like so many who've done bad things in the real world, he considers himself to be on the side of good, despite murdering millions of people. And part of the point of the story is to make you question if he's right. As is the case with many utopians such as himself, his single-minded devotion to his vision of saving the world is what leads him to do the terrible things he does. In the film, he is all of these things, just done worse. There are a few issues I take with Adrian's portrayal where most changes make him seem more overtly villainous than he is in the book, more like something from a traditional Hollywood superhero tale, which embodies all of the tropes that he was created to actually subvert. The most glaring change is him just expositing his backstory to journalists. In the comic, he's charming and friendly to the press, but very guarded and careful to never give anything away that the public doesn't already know. He only reveals his backstory to his faithful servants at the end of the book, who he's already poisoned and therefore can't tell anyone. So his reveal is actually treated by him as almost a final reward for these people's efforts. Adrian is a narcissist after all and only sees his equal as being Dr. Manhattan. But in the film, he just gives it all away, unprompted to journalists. I imagine this was to ensure audiences weren't too confused by Adrian's role in the story, but it actually just makes him stick out at first. And by the time you get the full picture of what he's done, it just makes him seem clumsier and dumber than his comic doppelganger. He's constantly talking about his plans to save the world and his great admiration for Alexander the Great and the ancient Egyptians. Not only does this make him come across as less savvy and secretive than his comic counterpart, it also makes the audience wonder, why tell us this? Why is this side character's backstory and motivations important if it's not gonna come back up in the story? These sound like the sorts of things a villain would say. This illustrates a point about adaptations. We get the same information, more in fact than the comic, but simply changing the context in which this information is given changes how we view it and the character. But the worst sin the film commits with Adrian is not including his last scene from the book, where he spills his soul to Dr. Manhattan and reveals that despite his planned success, he still has his doubts and references the comic within a comic subplot of the Black Freighter, implying that he doubts the morality of his actions, uh, may have condemned his soul, and made the world worse by committing to his plans. The sliver of doubt that Adrian felt which added depth to his character and expanded the story's themes is gone. Also gone is Manhattan's line that nothing ever ends, which highlights that no matter what is done now that may temporarily bring peace, there are no clean endings, because time doesn't just stop. In the film, however, Dr. Manhattan 
cucks Dan and then pieces out before this happened. And in its place is Dan punching Adrian in the face and saying he's deformed humanity. To this, Adrian doesn't seem particularly phased. And doesn't this message coming from Dr. Manhattan, a demigod, and the closest thing Adrian sees to an equal have so much more weight and meaning to it than from Dan? Dan's an ordinary man, honestly someone that Adrian would have happily blown up if he happened to be in New York during the explosion. Why would Adrian care what he has to say? In fact, he doesn't. Dr. Manhattan's final line leaves Adrian doubting himself. Dan just leaves him more sure of himself. And for the life of me, I can't understand how any person could think that this was either true to the comics or an improvement. Snyder and the screenwriters left out one of the pivotal scenes of the book to make room for a soppy, romantic send-off with a big blue bell end. Hardly an improvement. In the end, adaptation is a very tricky thing. And the more you change, the less like the original your version will be. Don't get me wrong, Watchmen, for all its flaws, is an enjoyable film made by someone with an obvious passion for the source material, even if I don't like some of the decisions he made. But with showrunners, producers, and arrogant filmmakers happier than ever to ride the goodwill of popular names and established franchises while spitting in the face of their legacies and fans, Watchmen might actually be one of the last modern adaptations that truly tries to capture what made the original so great, rather than butcher it and wear it as a skin suit to push woke messaging. With properties like Lord of the Rings and the new Amazon series Rings of Power, the danger is twofold. For one, the original creator, along with the caretaker of his legacy, otherwise known as the best son ever, Christopher Tolkien, is dead, and therefore has no say in the development of the show. Secondly, at first I thought it was adapting an area of the law that is creatively untapped, the Second Age, focusing on some of the events described in the Silmarillion, which acts as a, fish, uh, which acts as a fictional history book. This would have caused some issues with the adaptation and meant that the showrunners had only very basic details to go off and not many limitations for how many liberties they can take with Tolkien's original vision. But then it came out that Amazon doesn't even have the rights to the Silmarillion, meaning that what we're getting is expensive fan fiction, written by two unknown showrunners who aren't even real fans of Tolkien, judging from what we've seen from the teaser trailer and promotional images. I spoke about Watchmen completely destroying characters by accident. Uh, by simply removing lines or changing the context of their actions. And now the promotional images are showing Galadriel, someone who never took part in battles or was a warrior as part of the established law, walking around in full plate armor in a siege like the paper thin girl boss archetype we've seen trotted out far too often in recent films. When you're making changes that substantial, just to pander to modern audiences' attitudes of a woman's role in action series, how well do you think the Rings of Power is going to capture the magic that Tolkien created? Rings of Power teaser trailer just looked like every other generic fantasy trash available on streaming services, and, if we're honest, is destined to die as one too. This is basically all a long-winded way of saying when adapting a beloved property, sure, you can make changes, but be damned careful about what you change. And if you have no true love or understanding for the original work and what it stands for, then you have no right to trample over its legacy and parade its rotting corpse around just for the money. If you do truly love something, sometimes the best thing you can do is leave it dead.